This is going to be a really fun podcast because I've got an angler that is featured right here. Look at that's him right there, Darren Trosif, the catfish master of Minnesota. That's what I'm going to call him. Um, Darren, I don't know if you want to be known as that, but you're certainly, uh, that's how I know you. I've learned a ton from you. Uh, you help me uh, uh, know what bites are kind of going on, and, and you've always been fantastic. I've always enjoyed our conversations. We're going to have another great one here. Let me just, this is Darren right here. I mean, look at, he's got a lake sturgeon behind him. Uh, he is also the holder of the catch and release lake sturgeon record in Minnesota. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. Darren's the man. Let's get into it. This isn't another fishing podcast. This is another fishing podcast. Well, Darren, uh, thanks for coming on another fishing podcast. And yeah, I've, uh, well, first and foremost, I want to just thank you. You uh, let me in on a bite like, uh, last year on the Horseshoe Chain of Lakes, which is up uh, Cold Spring area, Cold Spring, Cold Springs. Is it Cold Spring Cold or Cold Springs? Cold Springs. <laughs> I should yeah. probably know that. <laughs> uh, but you let me in on a, on a bite happening up there last summer. Um, catfish. I, I go up there to, to catch channel catfish in the winter primarily, but you're like, hey, dude, there's a fun bite going on up there. You uh, just basically put some shrimp on a hook under a float, fish uh, in five feet, basically like target about five foot of water, and it's on, and that's exactly what happened. The weird thing about it, though, is that it kind of just like all forms of fishing, catfish can shut off. And I caught some really good ones, and I probably could have caught some more if I had heavier tackle, <laughs> but I took so long getting them in with like a medium light rod that, that you know, it, it's, it just took a little bit longer. But um, I want to, number one, just thank you for that. And, um, you know, you used to go up there quite often, and, and that's actually how I learned about you. I saw you doing ice fishing videos uh, up there, and and I was like, I got to get up there and do that. So, thank you. And yeah, t is that how you first really like fell in love with catfish, or what what happened there? Yeah, I mean, first of all, thanks for the uh, invite here. I'm always so jealous looking at your camera and your setup there. It's always so professional, and <laughs> here's well, me. The little uh, paneling in the background. You know well as I do, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference for the internet. So I'm an old school television, produ you know, television production guy, and this is all overkill. Yeah, I just I appreciate it. So, but yeah, the uh, it's the horseshoe chain is kind of a unique thing. You know, they uh, the DNR. Yeah, I don't want to say back in the 80s or 90s. Um, they put all these catfish in there to control the bullhead population, and they did an awesome job. They ate all the bullheads, but what happened is they just flourished. And it's, you know, as you might know, it's a river system and, and catfish like current and river systems, and, and they just exploded. And in fact, you know, over the last, whatever, 20 or 30 years, um, they've got to the point where the DNR actually decided that they want to try to get some of more of those fish out of there just because there's so many. So they actually increased the bag limit from five to 10 in an effort to try to reduce that uh, population density. And I do think it has been helping um, from what I've found just as my last few trips up there is um, you're seeing more bigger fish and less density. And uh, so I think that is working, but uh, it's kind of a working progress. So it is nice seeing those bigger fish and hopefully the, the people take advantage of this bite are keeping the smaller fish and letting those bigger fish live because it's it could turn into a really great fishery up there. Yeah, I'm I'm really impressed um, by the size because uh, do you do you want to talk about individual lakes up there? Or we could we should we just be generic with with uh, what what are your thoughts on that? I mean, here's the thing: they they all have names, but they're all the same body of water. They're all connected, so it really doesn't matter, honestly. Um, I've fished several of them. There, I I don't even know how many there are in total. You know, maybe 10, 12, 15, But um, there's catfish in every single one of them. And when someone tells you the hot bite is at one, you you can go to another one and find the same thing so i kind of find my favorites just based on location and uh you know accessibility to ramps and stuff but um i don't think there's one better than the other yeah i i mean i have most most of my experiences on long lake and on browns lake um you know i've caught I've, I've browns lake i've seen guys catch good catfish out of i've caught good catfish out of long lake but the lo for the longest time uh it seemed like those fish were stunted 
And now I guess it's what's going on is that those those regulations are taking those smaller fish out. There's less um, there's less competition. And so the the idea is is that they're getting these fish are getting bigger. Um, it, it, do you think that's what's going on there? That's been my experience. Like I don't know if that's what's happening, but that's what I've experienced personally. And just following some reports and stuff, it seems like you know that size structure and is going up and the density is getting smaller. I mean, you could go up there, you know, in the early days and catch easily over a hundred, but they're all the, uh, you know, 17 to 21 inch variety. And the last trip I went up there, I got several over 30 inches, you know, and not a hundred, but um, much bigger fish. Yeah, that's that's fantastic because when I, I, I was eaten up with it when I first ice fished up there and got into them good. And it's an experience and they were not, you know, they were really, really fun. Don't get me wrong, but they were not big. They're, you know, I, I'm not sure. I'm from the bass world, you know, so I'm, I'm like everything's in pounds. So I, I don't like inches. I'm terrible. But I mean, they were they were good sized catfish. They fought like hell. Dare I say harder than any walleye. But it, it was, you know, I, I just it was so much fun to do it when you get into them and you got into them a lot there uh, just on average, you know, because there were so many in there. Um, so can you kind of explain that, just that, how unique that is? It doesn't really happen a lot that you can catch catfish under the ice and, and them be so plentiful and it's, you know, pretty consistent action. Um, and then just kind of what happens, you know, during the year, like seasonal movements there, you know, they're in the winter, you know, you're, you're basically looking for like deeper holes, kind of more of the basin area. Um, but you, you're, you're better at that than I am. Just kind of go through if you could, uh, you know, what catfish are doing in a system like that, like seasonally. So, yeah, like you mentioned, so in the wintertime, which is how I got into fishing for them because cause I wanted to, you know, I kind of like that niche thing of catching them through the ice. And like you say, it's um, you can do it, but it's just they're not really aggressive in the wintertime. But just the fact that there's so many in that system and competition, I think, kept them really active. Um, so, yeah, they, these tend to, you know, kind of school up in these holes and then, you know, every once in a while they will go up into the shallows surrounding those holes. And it seems like the more aggressive fish that you find are kind of going up into the shallows a little bit to, to look for some food during, you know, some of the low light periods. Um, but if you find the, the large school, I mean, you put your flasher down, it's literally, you know, 15 feet of fish sometimes. Um, you can catch those fish, but it's usually the smaller ones. Um, so then after, as the spring rolls around here, they slowly move out of those holes and they start moving up into the shallows. You'll find them in neck down areas and where the current is. Um, a lot of time, this is the time of year, you know, where people are catching a lot of them from shore because they move into the shallows. And right before spawn, they're moving into the extreme shallows. You'll find them in, you know, one to two feet of water. And there's uh, not just this lake, uh, this horseshoe chain, but, you know, any lake that has catfish in them in the early spring, you know, a good way to find them is in the, you know, the dark, stained, warm water, the sloughs. Um, people don't think they're in that shallow, but they will be very shallow right before spawn and get really active. And you can get some really big ones, you know, full of eggs. That's when you really see the the really large fish caught. Uh, then, you know, they'll go and they'll spawn and the bite will slow down for a while as what's, they're doing their business. What's that? When's uh, the, the time period when they're spawning? What's the water temperature time of the year? We're, we're up in Minnesota, but. Yeah, basically right now, I mean, we're right right in that midst of it, you know, uh, generally uh, Memorial Weekend uh, to mid-June is usually when they start their spawn. Um, in May, you'll see those big fish being showing up and being caught, and then those, the bite will slowly kind of taper off. And we're kind of in that period right now. We had a really late spring this year, so it might be later this year. Um, but, yeah, once they, uh, once they get done spawning, uh, then there's, they're transitioning back out kind of into that deeper water a little bit. And then they start focusing on, you know, we in that body of water, they're kind of relating to the weeds and they're using those weeds as their food source. And uh, like you said, a, a, as we go into the summer, then they get really active, getting ready for the fall. And that's when, to me, that's the best time to be out there is probably, you know, August, September, uh, taking advantage of that bite we talked about. 
Yeah, that's that's uh, it's it's a lot of fun. I really appreciate you uh, you give me a heads up on that. And then I did a video, um, a YouTube video, and and you know it was it was just a blast. I mean, they would it, it they would uh, they were so aggressive. You know that that float or bobber. If, you know, sophistication is if you're very sophisticated, you call it a float. But I mean, that bobber just go boom. You know, and and it was just I, I don't know. I love channel catfish. I know you know flatheads are kind of put on a on a pedestal a little bit more, but I just I love them all. And um, I've always been a multi species guy. I probably know more just kind of you know what to do. I guess you know with bass, but really I love catching anything. Um, and so we're very lucky in Minnesota. In some ways, you know, yeah, the winter it's 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 tough. It's so long, but we have such a plethora of of opportunities around here just as far as channel catfish we'll get into the sturgeon fishing but what kinds of other species is too uh species too like bass and walleyes and pike and it's it's like a obviously it's minnesota it's a fisherman's paradise but you just got to be able to handle the winters that's the only that's a that's a big you know asterisk there but um you know we're we're we're, we're dealing with it you know we're minnesotans we're tough but I wanted to, I kind of, I gave you a little bit of an intro in the beginning, but I, I want to talk more about like, you know, first, before we get in real deep here, you own Three Rivers Fishing Adventures, which is a guiding business. You guide, on, it's called Three Rivers for a reason. You guide on the St. Croix, the Miss, uh, Mississippi, and the Minnesota River. So you're, you're a uh, successful guide. Major kudos. I'm actually looking at your website right here. Looks great. I'm looking at this in the backdrop, this giant flathead that you're kind of you're getting ready to release, which is awesome. Um, but you know, um, kudos to just I kind of we kind of got to know each other. It seems like when you were just starting that guide business, and I'm super impressed with the clientele you've gotten, and uh, um, so just awesome job there. But you're also, so like I said, you're, you're doing the catfish, uh, sturgeon, you're an avid catfish and, and sturgeon angler. You hold the current Minnesota catch and release record for Lake Sturgeon at 78 inches. I wanted to kind of go into that a little bit. Um, you caught that, you caught that fish through the ice, correct? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Just, just in how many pounds do you think that thing was? Uh, estimate was uh, probably 120 pounds. That's what we, by measurements, you know, kind of a length girth formula. So yeah, about 120 pounds. Yeah. And so that's the very, I, is, is anybody like doing that on the rainy river? So in here in Minnesota, there's basically two uh, places, I guess, that most well known anyway, uh, to catch Lake Sturgeon is the St. Croix River and the Rainy River. But I don't hear much about ice fishing. I maybe I don't know if it's anybody's doing it or it's allowed. I don't know. But is there any ice fishing going on on the Rainy River for sturgeon? There is, and if you go on YouTube, there's uh, several videos of guys catching uh, sturgeon up there uh, on Lake of the Woods as well as the river. Part of the problem is the uh, the river sturgeon there. Um, there's quite a bit of current in that river, so it's uh, you do have to find specialty spots that don't slush up or don't have you know poor ice conditions, and um, you really got to know what you're doing uh, in order to fish the river up there. But they do catch some nice ones in the river, and out there on the lake, like in Four Mile Bay, and as you go further out, they do catch them out there too. But um, what I'm finding is that you know these sturgeon it's it's more like deer hunting you know you go out and you you sit out there for many 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 hours to catch these fish um they're not super active but they are still feeding they're just not schooled up and you're not catching you know you know 10 12 15 fish a day you know you, you're putting your time in but there definitely are anglers up there catching them in the winter time and, and i'm seeing more of it also as well as uh, you know the st louis river um, Lake Superior, and also the one coming on now is uh, Otter Tail. That system there. Um, no out kidding. On, I, I saw some really nice ones cut on Big Stone this winter too. So wow. that's kind of the uh, up and coming one. Oh, that's fantastic! I didn't know there was all that going on. That's that's yep. uh, that's that's great to hear. Um, so yeah, let's kind of the thing that's pretty amazing. When I first moved to Minnesota. I don't, I guess it was 2009, I, I don't, or yeah, it was 2009, fall of 2009. I don't think, when did that season open on the St. Croix? 
it's relatively new, right? I mean, you know. Yeah, it's, it, it's you're putting me on the spot here, but yeah, it's somewhere somewhere in that area. Um, there was there was always a, sort of a, a harvest season, kind of that coincided with the Wisconsin season uh, in September, October ish. Uh, where you could go because it's a border water was kind of shared regulations with Wisconsin. So yeah, you were able to go out there and and fish for them then. Um, but that was it. That was it for the whole season. So um, they went ahead and expanded that for uh, mostly catch and release. Um, basically like almost, you know, nine, nine out of the 12 months of the year. So that really helped out and expanded the, uh, the enthusiasm to go out there and catch them. Yeah, it's the numbers are really impressive on the St. Croix. I mean, you know, it, it's it's a pretty huge success story, I would say, just as far as the you know what they've done with that fishery. Um, it it seems like it. You're much closer to that than I am, but um, as far as just the numbers and then the size, it seems to have increased. Um, you know, I, I'm super impressed. You catch what's your average when you're out there. You start fishing in September form, right? Is that typically when? Yeah, the, so the season uh, does start up again, like I believe it's in July, uh, June, July-ish. But I usually won't go out there just because of recreational traffic. But you can go out there and catch them right in the dead of the summer. And I have been seeing a lot more uh, activity now, people going out in August and catching them too, which is kind of a new thing as well. But, yeah, I don't start till September mostly just because I'm doing a lot of catfish stuff. And also just because of recreational traffic out there, I don't want to deal with it. But um, on a typical night, you know, we're probably catching five to 10 sturgeon a night. And, you know, I have had some 50 plus nights, which is crazy. You know, those nights you do have those really high numbers. It seems like you're catching kind of marginally smaller fish, you know, and I say smaller, I'm talking, you know, 30 to, you know, 50 inches versus, you know, when I'm saying big fish, we're talking, you know, 50 to 60 plus. So um, the nights we catch lots of them, it seems like there's a little smaller maybe they're schooled up in sizes but there's definitely an opportunity to catch uh, a lot of fish out there and it's kind of weird because it feels like there's so many and everyone's catching fish but according to the tagging data um it kind of shows that that population isn't as big as people think and we might just be catching the same fish over and over again so that's kind of an unknown to the community <laughs> And so how you're you're averaging uh what's what do you what do you think the average is like you know like when i mean that's hard it seems like yeah, that big of a fish to catch multiple fish it seems to be pretty common on the saint croix you know which I, is quite a treat to have that basically i mean it's you're within the city limits you know like you can, it's it's kind of right. it's urban fishing basically and you're catching you know guys will catch a number of them at times, you know, and they're they're great big fish. You know what? Could you could you put out a number that you think is kind of average and average, you know, number that you're catching? Like for average size? Well, average like the the quantity, I guess, more than anything. Yeah, uh, yeah I would say probably an average trip we're catching, you know, five to ten, and the average size is probably you know right around that, right around forty inches, probably um, thirty five to forty inches. That's awesome. And I mean, after seeing so many of them, to me, a 40 inch fish is pretty small, but to your average angler, I mean, that's a really big fish. And that's the thing I, I hear over and over and over again from um, people I take out is like, you know, we're right next to home here, right next to, you know, metro area. We hardly go out from the dock. We just go out into the channel and we catch all these big fish. They're just, you know, flabbergasted by that. Yeah, it's 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 an awesome fishery. Just to, and they're they're a really unique fish, you know. So just the the idea of catching essentially just a, you know, it's a cartilaginous fish. That might be a big word. It's a, actually a very big word for me. But basically, it's it's the same. It doesn't have bones. It it has um, the skeletal structure is made of cartilage, just like a shark. So it's a it's a really ancient fish. Very very interesting. And so if you're just a fish nerd. There, even if it's a small fish, it's a, an amazing fish to catch. Um, so I, I just feel very blessed that we have that near us, you know. Um, and I guess I need to go back to the, the catfish on the Horseshoe Chain Lakes thing here after I ask this question. But how, so the sturgeon deal, how are you catching those guys? Well, I forgot to ask you about, like, we should probably let people know how, how you catch catfish up at the 
uh, horseshoe chain lakes. But so what's the typical uh, rig that you're using to catch sturgeon on the St. Croix? So, you know, going back to you talking about how special a fish it is, to me, I tell everyone, I to me, I kind of consider it the ultimate sport fish just because um, – they're so easy to catch and touching on what we use. I mean, it's, it's a simple bottom rig. So we're using like a, you know, five to seven to eight odd circle hook, uh, you know, a, a 15 inch leader and just enough weight to keep it on the bottom. And you just wait for them to come or, come along and suck it up. It's, it's really as easy as that. You can, you can generally go out and throw an anchor anywhere out in the river channel and just wait for these fish to come through. So um, yeah, they're super easy to catch. Um, they're big, they fight, um, they take well to catch and release. They're tough fish. I mean, they can be out of the water for a long time. You're not dealing with teeth when you handle them. You're not getting cut. I mean, it's really, to me, it's the ultimate sport fish. And to top it all off, sometimes they'll just jump completely out of the water when you're fighting them. So uh, it's it's a lot of fun. So what are you? what's your favorite bait to, to use to, to catch uh, Lake? Uh, lake sturgeon i've used just gobbed up night crawlers you know and that can work really really well if you can't find you know like shad or what go ahead and like just get into that as far as like the baits to use for sturgeon yeah so i i mean i i kind of stick to what's native to the system so um generally everywhere you go a, you know a ball of night crawlers is going to be your number one bait these fish are scrounging through the mud they're digging up bugs um, crayfish, you know, kind of, you know, just whatever they can find, they're scroungers. And uh, uh, night crawlers is, you know, generally they're eating the uh, the red worms. So, like, you know, you see these uh, these guys sturgeon spearing over in, in Winnebago. They're, some of those guys will actually take, like, core samples and try to find these red worms in the core of the, wow. you know, right. So they really get involved trying to find these red worms. So if you can find the red worms, you're probably going to find those sturgeons. So that's why uh, night crawlers are such a good bait because they're eating these red worms. Um, but now in the St. Croix, it's just full of these gizzard shad. They're everywhere. And they come out in the late fall. They, they're they almost cyclical. You know, they'll, they'll spawn. Um, those get bigger throughout the year and then they just kind of die off. They're, they're basically their main purpose is as a bait fish and everything eats them out there, including the sturgeon. So, um, as these giant schools of shad are moving around, you got fish tearing them up, all fish in the system and they're wounding them. They're falling to the bottom. Um, and, and I'm sure these sturgeon probably even eat these live shad as well too. So, um, that was one of the big things with the, the Minnesota DNR. We didn't have a way to catch these shad, and we knew they were good bait. Um, so we did work with the, the Minnesota DNR in getting a, uh, a cast net legalized specifically for the St. Croix River and specifically for gizzard shad. And that has really changed a, a lot how we fish. So I'm out there catching shad basically every trip you know, beforehand. And they're pretty easy to find, especially with new technology. Um, I went and got a live scope, and that pretty much changed the, how I got bait. You know, you just run around finding these schools of shed, and you can point the live scope right That's at amazing. the amazing. Throw the net. You just watch the net come right over the bait, and you're you're good for the night. So That's amazing. <laughs> well, kudos on getting that pass through the the legislature <laughs> i guess that's what you, you're more uh, political than i am i don't even know the correct term or not the legislature yeah, I, uh, yeah I, so I kudos on that, that dude. actually uh actually had to go through I, I don't remember if that was a policy or how that all unfolded i just know we got it done and it helped a ton so that's awesome um, dude. yeah they had a they actually have like a uh work groups through the dnr for stakeholders so they have different species they have a you know a bass a panfish a walleye a pike and they also have a, a catfish one and that was kind of the one one of the ones that the the catfish group put through so um yeah it's definitely there's a lot of hoops you got to jump through you know with permitting and invasive species and stuff but at the end of the day it's it's well worth it and it's better than not being able to do it so yeah for sure what what are you um as far as your gear for for sturgeon uh and again i we need to touch upon we need to go back to the the uh horseshoe chain of lakes channel cat uh, discussion here after i i quiz you on all the sturgeon stuff but what what are you using as far as equipment what's your, like your preferred equip, uh, equipment for open water uh sturgeon so i use like a uh, eight foot 
seven and a half foot to eight foot uh, fiberglass rod. Uh, the particular ones I use are Mad Cat's rods, and it's uh, any any heavy you know catfish rod will work. Um, you know, a lot of guys use musky rods; those work fine. Um, thing you got to be careful with is though some of these uh, graphite blanks. If you put too much pressure on them, I've seen a lot of them snap. So that's why uh, you know a lot of us use fiberglass rods, just because they're a little more forgiving. When you do hook into like a seventy-inch fish, you want to be prepared because um, there there's no drag stopping these fish. So. Um, you can kind of be oversized at times and undersized at times. It's it's kind of hard to cover the whole, you know, 30-inch to 70-inch fish. You kind of want to be in the middle ground and be ready for either one of them. So, um, but yeah, I, I, seven to eight foot, you know, medium heavy to heavy rod. And I, I prefer using a, a spinning setup myself just for, uh, I found that it works better with uh with my guests in the boat that i take out on guide trips i can uh kind of switch the handle from one side to the next if they're more comfortable that way it's easier for them to cast and there's there's just a couple more benefits of uh using a spinning rig but uh casting bait casting rods are just as popular and and i really don't see a a preference either way I i think they both work fine and uh really you just need something with a lot of drag and something that's forgiving and you just hold on and and tire those fish out (laughs) so what are you so when you go to the uh hard water season when you get ice uh on the on the st croix and you're ice fishing for them what kind of gear are you using then it's there are a few specialty sturgeon rods that companies uh, have been putting out now uh you know large pike lake trout rods um, you know, we're talking probably 40 to 50 pound test in like a, a 4,000 series reel. Um, we do, uh, you can, again, you can go undersize and oversize there as well. Um, you kind of find out after you catch a few, what your preference is and everyone has their own preference, but, um, I'm using a, uh, 40 to 42 inch, you know, extra heavy rod with, uh, with a 4,000 series reel. So and for this a little controversial uh for the ice i kind of like to use in the treble hook i find that i i do get a little bit better hookup percentage um and i i don't know just the way they uh they eat the bait and you're fishing vertically straight up and down i feel like sometimes uh we do get a little better hookup ratio using a uh, a treble hook and i can pack a little more bait on there as yeah. well so um you do end up you know a fish will come by and you know as you're fishing vertically the, they're they're peck fins you can see back behind me here you know i don't know if you can see that or not but That's they're an awesome print, fins are, you know they're like big that. airplane wings so they come across and sometimes they'll run into your line and and no matter what kind of hook you're using sometimes you do um end up getting a follow hook fish and that does happen so um it's kind of hard to avoid that sometimes yeah it's it's a it's a weird deal i've i know some guys like to use just like a essentially like a jigging spoon you know and that's just sitting down there it's not it's no not providing any action it's just there is a weight and then you gob up a ton of night crawlers <clears throat> or whatever uh, onto the treble hook and that's you know they they come by and they you know um the, the the weird thing about it is, yeah, you're fishing vertically, right? So your line uh, is going straight down, and there's a there's a current there, so it'll bow. But uh, I, I think a lot of the problems will be when you know that fish, its its a, its mouth is below, it's got its its nose that will hit that line, and you might think you have a bite, and it's actually just you know the the sturgeon hitting your line, and he might be getting ready to eat it but that's always that's always the weird thing like what it, it, what's the best rig to have a better hookup percentage you know right. um yeah. i've even thought like like a carol i've like a carolina rig or something or you know your typical like bottom rig that that way you know i don't know <laughs> i don't know if the, um, the problem I, the problem with that is is if you have too much slack um behind your sinker sometimes they can pick it up and you don't even know that they mm, picked it up you know because mm-hmm. they got that slack there so yeah. um honestly what what's kind of changed for me is using a, a live scope now i can see what they're doing wow. you know i can you know 
I can awesome. see, you know, which rod they're on. You know, if, if they're tail slapping the line, I can tell, you <laughs> that know. That is so <laughs> cool, man. I can't, I hadn't even thought about live scope for, for stir, you know, ice sturgeon. That is, that is, awesome. that yeah. is such a great <laughs> idea. And then if you have like a, a hub style shelter or something and you could set up a TV here, like a oh, big, sure. oh my yeah. lord. Oh, yeah. You'd be surprised at the setups guys have out there. It's unbelievable. Yeah, that's really, really Mostly cool. Because you're waiting for so long, you know, guys get bored. And that's why some of these goofy rigs you see people come up with, it's because there's nothing else to do. You just come up with things. Oh, I think I'll try this, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, so what, can you go into just the seasonal movements? Now, I know there's a lot of unknowns with sturgeon. They're kind of, I mean, at least that's what I believe, right? There's a lot of, lot of unknowns as far as how they're moving. Uh, in the system, what what do you know about that? Like, what what do you try to look for in the open water uh, season, and then the ice fishing? Well, the one for sure known is that they're moving upstream to spawn every spring. That's that's a pretty much given. That's pretty well known, you know, throughout the community. Is that these fish go upstream and into tributaries to spawn, and it's quite visual. You know, they spawn in a foot of water, so it's easy to see that they're they're all spawning. You know, and um, at, after they spawn, they, they tend to move back down um, into the uh, basin area and uh, kind of that's their home for the summer. And then they get active again in the fall. So it seems like early spring and late fall are the two major activity patterns that I'm looking for. And that's when I'm targeting them because they're more active. And it's kind of like every other fish that, you know, that early and late period is in when fishing really gets good so um now these fish on the rainy system they're coming out of lake of the woods and it's really apparent what happens to them every spring you know they're coming into the rainy river and you can really ambush these fish as they're coming through and uh it's it's unbelievable i i run a, a sturgeon contest every spring and you know there's you know 30 to 50 guys that join it it's this catch and release thing on a fish donkey and i tell you what what happened this year the season ended may 15th i believe or something like that the last two weeks of that season was unlike anything i've ever seen in my life uh when it comes to sturgeon fishing i mean guys were catching you know 20 60 inch fish a day and they were catching fish over 70 inches it was just it blew my mind, and I just think that's just going to get better and better, and it's it's unbelievable. That that's that's awesome to hear. Um, I did want to touch on just uh, the the catfishing, um, just as far as up at the Horseshoe Chain of Lakes. Just what what are you um, as far as equipment in the open water deal? Like what are you using? Um, you know, typically, and then what are you using for ice fishing for for channel cats? So for the channel cats up there, uh, what I've been using, and I haven't done a whole lot of the open water thing. I was kind of turned on to this bite kind of like you were. And uh, so what I've been using is just like a medium to medium heavy walleye rod with a, you know, a 20 to 30 series spinning reel. And, uh, you know, I, I do like to go a little heavier on my line because they fight so hard. So, you know, I, I was using 20 to 30 pound uh, braid for that. And uh, like you said, it was, if you can imagine like, like uh spawn crappie fishing in the shallows where you're just using a float and your bait you know two feet below your float i was almost doing exactly what i was doing going around shorelines um targeting crappies in the spring i was doing the same thing i was doing for these uh catfish and uh you would toss it up and i was fishing docks weed lines uh snags kind of coming out off the shore um like you would maybe like for bass and you just toss that bobber up there and if it doesn't get hit within 10 to 15 seconds reel in and, and cast to your next target and it's like you say it's they just uh they hit that thing and it, your bobber's gone there's no tap tap you just look and it's it's under <laughs> yeah it's it's absolutely phenomenal so fun doing that are you are you basically using that you know a float um and minnesota is different you know because we, we don't get crazy hot up here you know um, our, our summers are shorter. Are you are you doing that float deal or guys doing that float deal uh, throughout the whole uh, open water season primarily? You know, are they pretty much shallow or do you have to go, I mean, you know, later in the summer or midsummer? Are they going deeper and you're fishing like a bottom rig, slip sinker rig or, or what what's happening there? 
I do think you can catch them like that throughout the season under the float, and uh, especially like low light periods. I think they're kind of uh, working these weed edges probably towards dusk and, and dawn. Um, I haven't done a lot, and I was our rivers are flooding here right now, and that was one of my uh, things on my list to do is maybe try to get up there and do that this spring and try to get a, a feel of, of what the pattern's like up there in the spring. But I just haven't had a chance to get up there. It's like an hour and a half drive for me from home here. So um, it's uh, definitely on my list, but it's also hard to do that real often with because I have the Minnesota River a mile yeah, from right Yeah, here. you're pretty much right in the, the middle of some amazing fisheries, right. for sure. So um, getting to in, into the winter for those uh, for those channels, what what is the typical setup you're using uh, to ice fish for channel catfish? I would say it's your typical walleye rod. You know, you'd use just a, a jigging spoon, a small jig, and uh, you, you just basically pinching off minnows like you would a walleye uh, fishing for walleyes you know uh, fathead heads crappie minnow heads and just kind of jamming them on the hook and uh, one thing i found is uh, they will react to your jigging up to the point where they get close to your bait then they don't want to see it jigged so i kind of try to get their attention um see them moving towards it on the sonar and then i just completely go and uh, stop everything and they'll come up and i've watched them on a camera so if you're you know your baits here they'll come up and they'll just kind of sniff it they'll feel it with their whiskers and all of a sudden they'll just kind of go vertical and they'll kind of go and they'll eat it and sometimes you'll see your bobber tip sideways and uh, that's them kind of grabbing it and they like they're not super aggressive at times and you have to really pay attention to your bobber and sometimes your bobber won't even go under it'll just start bobbing um so that's what I've found to be the most productive. Now I know guys are out there using uh, spring bobber rods or really flexible tip rods, and they're out there actively chasing these schools. And you can be really successful doing that too, as well, especially with live scope. Um, but there are days where they're pretty finicky as well. So um, it, it it depends day to day. Um, I, I guess yeah. that's yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah, no, that's my that's my experience too. I I basically would have a. I'd have a dead rod, which is just a, a, a rod just, you know, with a float. Uh, usually I've been on that dead rod. I really liked uh, the Northland creep worm. It glows really well. And it's just, uh, it's just, uh, what kind of hook is that that they have on it? It's just, uh, it looks kind of like a, uh, kind of like a worm, a quarter of a worm, you know, it's, and it's just, it's just plastic or whatever, lead. Yep. I don't know what it is, but it's painted and you can glow it and i'll just you know i'll put on a on a half a, a minnow or something i'll i'll take the head off or something whatever i'll use bits of a minnow on that and drop that down under a under a you know a foam float so that's my dead rod and then um i will on on the jigging rod i've used like what are some of the different uh spoons i've just just a regular um I don't know, typically was using like an eighth ounce, I guess, like a, a walleye spoon, something like that, with a minnow head on it. And then I would have a, a spring bobber because, yeah, you'd see them come up, and then I would just watch that spring bobber. Um, and if you're not familiar what a spring bobber is, it's just a, it's like a little, there's different uh, kinds of spring bobbers, but the ones that I uh, use... Um, are actually a spring that you have to kind of thread your line through out of the rod tip, the, you know, and then thread it through there and then put it back on the rod tip. But what that allows you to do, it's just a little spring and your line's going through that and allows you to see the most subtle bite. And that's what's happening with these guys in the winter. Um, they're just they're just really, um, they're, 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 they can be lethargic and just bite very, very negatively. So that spring bobber, you'll, you know, you'll jig, you'll get their attention. And then once they come up to it, um, I would just kill it. And then I would just watch that spring bobber and that spring bobber would go do it. And sometimes that spring bobber would, would go up. So they're feeding up and, you know, with it, but it, in either case, you're, you're learning, um, that, uh, you know that that you're, you know that spring bobber is alerting you to a very subtle bite that you would not have been able to detect if you didn't have that on there just with a regular rod tip because fish in the winter are just 
they're they're you know much more just they're they're slowed down so yeah that that spring bobber is it's i found it to be a pretty good tool yeah it definitely helps and there's definitely days when they're very finicky and and some days like that one of our uh, more productive baits is actually we take frozen chicken livers and we're just cutting little little pieces of these livers on and putting them on the hook and and that like i said we've had 100 plus fish days up there using chicken livers as well. And um, I did a, a YouTube video where I actually took some hot dog pieces and cut them up and I kind of soaked them in some uh, um, scent. And that actually worked too. I cut a few that way too. So um, yeah, I, I don't know that. Now the flatheads will kind of go into like this uh, hibernation state, you know, in the winter time. And I think part of that is uh, the channel cats do that as well. Like they definitely slow down and get lethargic and uh, they'll still eat, but it's definitely different from the summer. And I think the further North you go, it actually gets, you know, worse as well. Like, you know, the red river up in, uh, you know, Grand Forks, as you go up into Canada, um, up by Lake Winnipeg, you know, that's one of the best, channel cat fisheries in the world and these guys struggle to catch them in the winter time wow. they have a really hard time so i i think they just kind of completely shut down up there yeah that's that's i hadn't heard that i i had wondered about that if there's anybody doing that but yeah it's it's um i don't know i've it's they're really fun if you have a fishery where there's enough of them um you know to catch through the ice it's a really unique uh unique thing to do so what what is it about like catfish and sturgeon that just really trips your trigger? Like when did when why is it that that's what your your main target, and when did it happen for you that you just fell in love with these fish? So what happened with me is I grew up on Lake Vermilion and I fished up there like my whole childhood, and uh, you know mostly fished walleyes, bass, you know panfish or whatever. Um, then I really got I worked at a resort up there and I got into fishing for a big pike and then. Um, that's when the musky boom started and we started catching muskies up there as well. And that really kind of turned me on catching these big muskies. I really enjoyed catching those fish. And, uh, after that, I ended up moving down here to the uh, metro area and, uh, there was not a lot like that down here. So I was doing some uh, shore fishing in the area. I lived in Shakopee and, uh, you know, someone mentioned I should go down to the river and try, you know, fishing for catfish down by the river. And, I never caught a catfish in my life, not even a bullhead I haven't even caught. And uh, so I, one day I had some dead sucker minnows, so I thought I would just go ahead and, and try doing that. And uh, so I just went down, found a spot along the bank, and, you know, we didn't have Google Maps or anything like that that time. Of, you know, when, I forget that was like maybe, you know, 1999 or something like that. I just found a spot on shore threw out some sucker minnows on my uh and my bass rod and and just by chance i ended up catching a really big fish it was probably 45 pound flathead so uh awesome. i ended up breaking my rod and i was you know up to my waist in mud trying to i didn't know how to handle this fish you know and i just lucked out i had someone coming down the bike trail and i had one of these old uh, disposable cameras in my box you know just in case i would catch a big fish like that sometime and they were able to able to snap a picture of me as they were coming down the bike trail so i did get a picture of it and uh nice. i went home and my wife thought i saw a ghost the way i was acting she's like what, <laughs> you, you were know, a changed I man i was i was hooked after that and uh i ended up going to work the next day and telling a co-worker about it and it turns out he ran this uh, catfish league out of bell plain and and he invited me to join the league, and that's where I pretty much learned a lot about catfishing is is joining this catfish league and fishing with different guys every night of the week and learning their tactics, and And uh, uh, it was a, a really good experience. So we, you know, I was talking about how lucky we are to have just amazing fisheries around us living where we do. Um, but, you know, you your, your guiding business is called Three Rivers Fishing Adventures, and you're you're targeting uh, the St. Croix River, the Minnesota River, and the Mississippi River. Um, so let's kind of turn the discussion to flatheads now. Um, and the Minnesota, all, all those rivers got flatheads in them. Do you think there's one river of those three that's better for flatheads than, than the others? Yes. 
<laughs> I figured that would be the yeah I, I mean yeah I'm, I'm not gonna speculate but yeah it's um so go if you would go into so we've talked about channel catfish we're, we're good on the channel cats now I, they do things different in in river systems but I think we're good on the channels let's really dive into flatheads now we've cut I think we've covered sturgeon well um let's dive in the flatheads flatheads are an amazing fish they're just very well designed for current if you they're, they're flat heads the reason they have a flat head is that they're just supremely designed to just hold in current um and so you know the minnesota river is this dirty you know it's silty it's just it's got tons of just fallen trees in it and you look at it and you're like wow you know what is living in here and the reality is there's giant massive just enormous monsters living in the minnesota river they're living in the mississippi river living in the st croix but um it's just and you're kind of you're not far from any of that so just kind of go into okay what are what are flatheads doing you know and and like go through their seasonal movements and then how the hell you catch them yes yeah, so so i mentioned you know in, in the winter time they're kind of in this state of hibernation they get in these big schools um and they just lay dormant you know once the water temp is below 40 it's there's scientific studies out there showing that they just don't eat they just quit eating um they they school up they sit in, they sit in there until the uh water temp gets you know maybe up till 40 or 50 in the spring and then they slowly one by one they kind of move out of these schools and they they get ready to start making babies and that's the only thing on their mind is eating and making babies at that point so um you know, catfish, when people think about big catfish, flathead catfish, just catfish in general, they're thinking dog digs the summer, you know, um, July, August, you know, bugs are bad. You're out there in the middle of the, you know, summer. That's the catfish time. Well, I think the best time is right now. If you want to catch a trophy catfish, it's right now till probably the middle to end of June when they start spawning. Um, they're active. They're moving. They're uh, eating. They're getting fat um right now is when you want to be targeting them and unfortunately our rivers are flooding right now and the people are getting a few right now but it's it's uh it's tough until those that river gets back within its banks and you can start um targeting some structure creek mouths things like that um then you're going to start catching them and so the other kind of uh myth i would say about flathead catfish is that you have to have big lively bait and don't get me wrong big lively bait works good and they will uh, uh, trigger a bite these flatheads will find this especially if, if they're on the hunt um, you know working these creek mouse or shallow flats after dark uh, but you can catch some really nice big flathead on a big chunk of uh, cut you know sucker or uh, any rough fish from the system you know you chunk that up and throw it out there uh it's a good way to catch a big flathead catfish as well and that's how i caught that that big first one i caught was just a uh, a chunk of sucker probably that big and you know you're catching 45 50 pound fish so don't think that you have to go out and buy you know these big expensive you know 12 to 15 inch suckers or go out and find live bullheads uh yes they're good but um if you can just find medium suckers and cut those up, you're also going to be able to, you know, catch these flatheads. And, and the bonus is you're going to catch some nice channel cats as well in the process too. So, um, but yeah, those fish, so those fish are active now. Um, they'll move into spawn, you know, probably late June, mid to late June, early July, they start spawning and then there'll be kind of a lull as they're spawning. They go, they're, uh, they're cavity spawners, so they're going into the side of the banks or digging holes or they're going into trees or tires or barrels or whatever. And you, you see these guys uh, down south, uh, they noodle these fish, and that's how they're they're doing that. That's what noodling is. People think they're they're hand fishing. Well, kind of, but they're uh, they're actually targeting their, their spawning habitat is what they're doing. So um, even like the guides down there, they have barrels that they just sink in these shallow water. And the, the flatheads will come and make their nest in these barrels. And then these guides know where these barrels are. So it's just like a milk run. They'll go to each one and they'll find one that has one in it. And what you do is you put your hand inside of this barrel 
and the fish is actually trying to protect its nest so that's why it bites and latches onto you and then you're able to pull it out of there so people think they're you know pulling it out of the mud or hand fishing catching them well it's it's basically just a response by these fish kind of uh, protecting their nests so that's kind of a a myth as well for these flathead catfish you know that they're not really hand fishing they're uh, kind of pulling them off their beds so to speak so uh um after they spawn then they get really territorial they'll go to their their snag of choice and a lot of times it's the same snag every year this big log jam and they'll these log jams might have you know one two three fish maybe kind of like a musky would you know on a on a hump or whatever and that's their home and they'll come out of their home they'll eat a big meal then they'll go back to their home so sometimes this fish you know as it's sitting in this snag you may only get an opportunity to catch this big fish maybe once every two or three days when it's coming out to eat so um, the fishing does slow down in the summer but you do see some uh, really big fish caught you know as they're out on the prowl looking for uh, for a meal and then as we go into fall they just kind of do that whatever they did in reverse uh, from winter they're moving towards their uh, their, towards their wintering hole and uh, eating and getting fat to sustain themselves for the rest of the winter. So um, the fishing does pick up quite a bit in the fall as well, too. And by that time, I'm kind of turned into sturgeon mode. So I kind of miss that uh, really good fall bite just because sturgeon fishing is so popular. And I find it much easier, so I kind of go over to that mode. Um, but, you know, you can catch some really nice flatheads right into, uh, you know, probably early to late October. Um, an interesting thing I'll just mention here is uh, um, there's the DNR has been doing some tagging studies just down the road here, uh, you know, a couple miles down the road in the on the Minnesota River, and uh, uh, one of the stories I read, a guy did a presentation for our, our group one time, and he said he had you know ten to fifteen of these flatheads tagged, and they're radio tagged, so he was actually able to exactly pinpoint where these fish were so he would go out every so often and find out where these fish were and as the summer progressed he knew exactly where each one of those fish was going to be just where they were before you know they were that there's so much of a homebody that he would he kind of knew exactly where these fish were what snag they were going to be at but then as fall came around he went out and then one day there was two or three fish missing they were just gone and then he went out the next day and all of them were gone. Every single fish was gone. He couldn't find them. So they had just gone to their wintering hole and it was just like a one or two day event. So what was I found interesting about that is like, you could be out there fishing this area and you're fishing for fish that aren't even there. They're just gone. Wow. So that, that scares me a little yeah. bit in the fall. Like, you know, yeah, like sure. they're, just, they're just not there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, what do you what do you think about as far as like time of the day? Is it is it important that you target flatheads more at night, uh, morning, evening? Do you, what are your thoughts on that? Like everybody thinks, oh, catfish, you got to fish them at night. Is that true? I think that's also seasonal as well. Like right now, I think you can catch them all day right now. Um, I think obviously like dusk and dawn are better the low light periods the fish get more active and i do think i think there is something to like lunar patterns and stuff and i don't track it or anything but i have seen enough like patterns um even as far as barometric pressure and there is a formula there that if you really dig in i think you could be successful i just don't have the uh time or energy to track all that stuff. <laughs> um, I do think there is something there. And I do think you can go out all day right now, pre-spawn, and you can catch them all day long if you want to. Um, I do think after spawn um, that the nighttime uh, is better. The low light period is better. I, I, I feel like, you know, the water's cooler. They're trying to, you know, cool off a bit. They go up into the shallows and they're chasing bait fish. And I think the, uh, the spawning of the bait fish and the bait fish cycle also... Uh, has a factor in that too where they are uh, set up and uh, you know wherever there's food you're going to find these fat these uh, flatheads so um, i think that's really the ultimate thing is finding the food uh, especially when they're out on the hunt yeah what uh so obviously you know finding them is a huge deal but once you know you've you've set up on a spot uh how are you catching it what's the gear to to be able i mean these fish get massive like massive like, like they're the, one of the i mean one of the biggest fish in minnesota so 
the rod, reel, line, uh, like shark hooks. It's it's completely different than like what what you're. I mean, it's like saltwater fishing. It, just just go into that. When I first started flathead fishing, I was just like, this is absolutely incredible. <laughs> yeah, I think you can you can kind of sort of get a little out of hand with that too. But yeah, I, I really like to match my gear to the bait I'm using. So if I decide I'm going to use a you know a big 12 inch bait, you know, like a 12 inch sucker, I'm going to want a 10 to 12 odd hook to put through that thing, or maybe even sometimes a a double hook rig, kind of like a a musky sucker rig, you know, something like that. Um, but I think you should match the hook to the size of your bait you're using. Cause if you're using too big of a hook on too small of a bait, that big hook will kind of uh, really wear down that bait and it'll end up dying on you. And if you want a, a live bait, uh, that's not ideal if your bait's dying. So um, generally my, my uh, go-to hook is probably a uh, seven to nine or seven to 10 odd uh, kale style hook. I, I like that they have a big gap. And that's a K A H L E kale. It's called Kali. Uh, there's different ways to pronounce it, but I do like the the big gap. These flatheads have giant mouths, giant lips, and you want the most gap in that hook when you set the hook that uh, you're not pulling it out of their mouth. And uh, you can use circle hooks. People are using circle hooks, and uh, there's a lot of bit of controversy whether you should use a circle hook or J hook, and uh, um, the one thing that I get concerned about with using circle hooks is sometimes these flatheads will come up, they'll chomp your bait. And when they chomp your bait, um, sometimes it's pretty violent. You'll just hear this big thump of your rod and that's the flathead sucking it in. If you ever watch a largemouth bass, like suck in a, a Senko or something, you know, that's kind of what they're doing to these 10 inch bullheads, you know, it's just gone. <laughs> and you see that big thump on your rod, but sometimes they'll do that and they'll come right at you. And you're reeling and you're like, I don't feel anything. Well, that fish is swimming towards you. Well, if you got a circle hook, um, you, you, you're not really able to set a circle hook because of their design. They'll just pull right out of the mouth. So that's kind of why I tend to lean towards a, a J or kale style type hook is you can reel down and you can pull a hook out of that bait and into the fish's mouth um, while he's coming at you if you need to. Um, now, if you if you have the opportunity to wait for that fish to swim away from you, um, that's your that's your best bet is waiting. That's what no, what we'll normally try to do is wait for the fish to swim away from us before we set the hook. But sometimes you don't have that opportunity because you're fishing in you know these big snag infested areas, and if you let them go too far, um, you're not going to get that fish out. And and speaking of that, there are a lot of places on the river where I know. There's probably a lot of big fish in there. You just can't get to them. It's so snaggy and tree infested that anytime you put a bait down, you're just going to get snagged or that fish is going to wrap around the log. And it's really frustrating knowing there's fish there and you can't target them. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, so what are you um, What are you basically for, for line? Are you going monofilament or primarily for flatheads? Are you using braid? What? I use all braid, even for my leader. So I like to use a short leader, probably 12 to 15 inch leader, and I'll use the same line as my main line. And the only reason I'm using a leader is just kind of to separate my hook from the bait. And I just use a sliding sinker. And so when that fish grabs it, it'll basically like a, a, a large Carolina rig or Lindy rig, you know, it, it, that sinker will slide as that fish picks it up and it doesn't really maybe feel the weight of that sinker. And uh, that's really the only using, reason I use a leader. I know some guys that'll run a sinker right down to their hook. They don't even use a leader and then put a bait on their, right, their right. hook like that. So um, there's definitely a lot of options. You can even catch flatheads on bobbers. And John, the guy I fish with quite a bit, he'll throw a, they actually make like bobbers out of like these pool noodles, just, you know, kind of cut them down. And, and uh, they offer a lot of buoyancy and, uh, you know, surface area to keep that bait afloat. And if we'll, we'll pull up to like a, a big eddy or something, and if he knows the depth of this flat, you know, he'll just toss it out and that bar will just circle around by shore. And all of a sudden I'll just, boom, <laughs> and uh, kind of like the channel catfish, you know, and then that, that bar will take off towards deep water. 
And if you've ever seen Jaws and see what that barrel looks like <laughs> when Jaws is taking that barrel, it looks exactly like wow. that. <laughs> That's really, really cool. So I, you can get like more uh, in-depth information by going to your favorite newsstand and getting the May issue of In Fisherman. Like I said in the intro, that is Darren right there. And if you go to, let's see here, go to 48, I believe. I have it... Uh, folded the page folded here look at this <laughs> there i got it there there's there's darren with a, a massive flathead catfish so and that, i mean that john i was talking about that used the bobbers he actually took that picture that was a really good picture he took he's kind of an amateur photographer so yeah that turned out really well yeah so he's uh yeah, it's it's just, and that's like the preferred way to hold them, right? For for pictures, like so, your your their back is towards the camera. Yeah, I mean the 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 popular photo is you know you grab the 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 lips you know and you hold them up like that. Well, when you get a really big fish like that, you're putting a lot of stress on the the rest of the body of that fish. And I we've caught fish with the jaws have been broken from people holding it like that mm. way. So oh, no kidding. Any big fish you can hold you know, horizontally, it's going to be much better for that fish, especially yeah. if you intend to release that thing. So um, the the Minnesota DNR has been releasing some things about uh, fish handling, which was nice to see, you know, like these big sturgeon, these big cats. It, just handle them horizontally whenever you can. That's always going to be the best bet for those yeah, fish. That's, for us, for that's, rates. Yeah, those big fish, that's the, that's the standard way to hold them you will be murdered in the musky world if you if you hold a a musky vertically gotta hold them horizontally big fish just a great great rule of thumb hold them horizontally uh, but what was that like you know getting in in fishermen i'm sure you're like me you grew up on in fishermen it's just like was a, i i was you know, still this day, I mean, Doug Stang, he's writing. I think he's one of the greatest outdoor writers of all time, at least for sure in fishing, um, I feel that way. But in fishermen to me is like the pinnacle in freshwater, you know, multi-species uh, freshwater fishing. So to see yourself, um, you know, on the on the cover of in fishermen, that's, I, that's really, really cool. Man, I saw this at the airport. And I was like, hell yeah, Darren. I was really, really happy for you. Yeah, it, it was, uh, I don't know, we're probably about the same age. So um, growing up, you know, when we were younger, that's all you had was magazines and VCR tapes. And, you know, you just didn't have stuff at your fingertip to just, you know, research and watch all the time. Um, when this magazine came out, whatever it was, monthly or whatever, I would read that thing cover to cover back and forth and you know i'd sit at my grandparents cabin and he had a subscription and that was all i had you know when i i wanted to learn how to do something that was my resource so um it was to me that was the best magazine that was available and uh you mentioned doug stangy he had he wrote a couple books i bought his books and and have one i had one signed by him you know and yeah, i'm just kind of embedded in that world when i'm younger and and um when I got the the invite to do a little interview for that, uh, I jumped at the chance, and and uh, you know, I, I just, it really uh, it was. I actually got a little emotional when I seen it, you know, because you you think about you know being in the magazine someday, and and there you are, and obviously it's what it is now is just a small, you know, portion of what it was way back when. You know, it's you know we're in a, in a digital world right now, so it doesn't mean a whole lot to maybe other people or people growing up now but to me i mean it was oh, i a think big, it's i think it's awesome here. darren i think it's awesome dude you should be very proud like you know i mean you're you're in the i mean in fisherman's all about authoritative sources and you know your deal it makes perfect sense that you would be in that so um i'm you know it's yeah, the in fishermen of the '80s when you know you would like it, it was like uh, I mean it was huge. It was it was that thick, the, the, and it was amazing. Like those magazines, um, but it's still something to be very proud of. So I'm I'm very happy for you, and it was a treat to see that you were on the cover here. I appreciate that, but it, it, the way I look at it is like uh, I don't know. I've had to run my mouth a lot just to you know get the attention in order to you know get the opportunity to do that so um i kind of don't see it as like a uh um a trophy or something like that you know because there's so many more better fishermen that deserve to be there they just don't 
um, either they don't want the attention or they, uh, you know, they just. Well, well, pe people people need a source of information. They need someone, and you're a great educator. Seriously, I'm not trying to blow smoke. You you are a great source of information. I've I've learned a ton from you. There's people that don't want to give out information, or they're just not comfortable, you know, um, you know, being on camera or just you know. There's a lot of people that are very shy and. But it's important that people like yourself that know how to catch these fish know, you know, um, that they're, you know, you're sharing information. So that's a that's a service. It really is. Don't take, you know, don't uh, sell yourself short or, or, you know, that's it's important for people coming into the sport to learn from guys like you that have been doing it. So, yeah, there's always going to be someone better. But you are providing, you're a guy that's on the water, you know, you run a successful guide business. I want to get into that here shortly, but, you know, you've got experience, so that is valuable. So just don't, yeah, don't sell yourself short on that. Yeah, I, I just like to let guys know that there's guys out there that no one's ever heard about before, and I completely look up to them, you know, like I'm always amazed at some of these guys, you know, spending so much time out on the river catching these big fish. So, and and people don't hear about these guys. They're out there, trust me. <laughs> so tell me, yeah, tell me about your guide business. So you got Three Rivers Fishing Adventures. You, uh, you're you doing uh, catfish and sturgeon on the Minnesota, uh, Mississippi, and the St. Croix. Uh, tell me how you started. Um, what's it like being a guide? It, it actually has turned out a lot better than I expected. I, I, at one point I said I would never do that. You know, I don't want to ruin my love of fishing by turning it into a job or a business. And, uh, you know, one day my wife was just like, you know, if you're going to be out there all the time, you might as well start taking some people out there and actually, you know, turning it into a little side business, you know. And um, the one thing with the uh, the river systems up here is they're under federal jurisdiction, so you do need a captain's license in order to guide for it. And that kind of keeps the, the competition down a little bit, actually, because people just don't want to go through all the trouble and expense of, of doing it. It's uh, not an easy task, to, to say the least, but... Um, she encouraged me to do it. She said, go do it. We'll, uh, we'll get you in the class and, uh, get all the needed, uh, equipment you need and requirements and insurance and, uh, you know, just put it out there and see if you get any business. So, uh, I did that one off season during the winter and, uh, just kind of put it out there and see what would happen. And it, uh, it has snowballed pretty good. Like it's, uh, I'm to the point where I could probably do it full time if I wanted to, there's that's enough awesome, dude. Business and interest. And that's kind of a, a scary transition for me, you know, going from a, I have a really good full-time job. I work at a, a good company. I work at uh, Abbott Medical and, and uh, you know, it's, it's hard giving up a good job like that with benefits and, and everything and vacation and making that leap. Um, but I, I love it out there. So um, that is something, you know, I have considered to do it just because everything i i've watched and, and learned says you should be doing what you love to do so um well the other reality too is you've been you know as far as making money on it like you know you you've had a youtube channel for a long time and i know two guys um that we kind of started so, you know social media around the same time and they they're making money off their youtube channels catfish is a great way it's, it's very popular on youtube um you know they're they're the kayak catfish um, and, uh, you know, and there's a number, there's a number of guys that are, that are doing well catfishing, you know, uh, with their YouTube channel. So, I mean, that isn't, that would be an option too. You know, you could, I, I think you do really, really well if you wanted to go that route. Yeah. What I found with, uh, with the YouTube thing is, so kind of the two ways to be successful is you either do videos um, kind of like uh, instructional or how-to videos that people will always come back to watch. Um, throughout the years, you'll have a video, you know, 10 years later, it'll still be relevant. People will come to back to watch it. Or you're doing something like three times a week and it turns into a full-time job and you become a personality. You know, there's kind of two ways to do that from what I've found. And, and right now, I, I, I haven't been able to jump into either one of them. So I just put up a video every now and then and, and try to keep it relevant and uh, hope the algorithm grabs it every now and then is all you can hope for, I guess. But um, as far as the guide thing, the, the one thing I did find out about the guide thing is 
it's not necessarily about catching fish or catching the biggest fish or being able to catch fish all the time. It's more of a people thing, you know, um, you know, being personable and, and listening to people and you almost kind of turn into like a, a counselor on the water, you know, and, oh, yeah. and showing people a good time and uh, engaging with them. And sometimes it doesn't even matter if you catch fish, if people are just out spending time with their family or, you know, getting away from the daily grind, you know, sometimes that's more important than catching fish. So um, I found that to be kind of uh, surprising and enjoyable at the same time. No, that's that's the sign of a great guide is that, you know, I've, I've known some guides that, you know, multi-species guides that they they would get kind of, and, and they're well known, I'm not going to name any names, one in particular, but he kind of had a reputation for getting frustrated. And this guy was like, everybody wanted to, to, to you know, be guided by this guy, but he he would get frustrated with his, his guests, you know, at times. And so it is really important to be a people person. If you can have, if you can be a people person and then also be a hell of an angler, um, kudos to you. That's a great combination to have because, boy, you really like dealing with, especially if you have a successful guide business, you're dealing with a lot of different personalities. Being able to handle those different personalities and just being chill and still putting them on fish, that's a, that's a great combo. The way I look at it is it, it's their trip, it's their night, whatever they want to do, whatever they're happy with. If if they want to pull a boat up to shore and look for rocks or mushrooms or, you know, whatever, yeah. they want to run 10 miles back to the ramp to use the bathroom, it's their night, you know, like they're we can catch fish whenever, you know, like I want to make the night enjoyable. You know, it's uh, that's why I call it adventures, because it's usually an adventure one way or another. So um, that that's the way I look at it. And, and that's kind of why I kind of rolled in my uh, unconventional tipping policy as well too i i kind of looked at it as how what what would i want to do if i hired a guide and and i don't even know if i've hired a guide maybe a couple times i've hired a guide but um when i go out i just kind of want to know i want to set cost a flat fee i don't have to worry about you know am i tipping them enough am i taking tipping them too much you know or is he doing this only because of a tip, of a tip? and so what i did is i just wiped out a tipping policy completely from my, from my, uh, from my fees. So I just do a flat, tr flat fee and I, I refuse all tips and I've, I've given back several hundred dollar bills before. Wow. So, no kidding. Um, wow. That's, that's, that's awesome of you. To yeah. Do that. I, I just, I know it's, uh, it's a little unconventional and people ask why I do that, but it's just one of the things that I decided I was going to do from the beginning and it's kind of carried forward here. So so not only uh, are you uh, operating a successful guiding business, um, you're also, uh, you know, running a number of tournaments and you're volunteering with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Go into that. Like, talk about these tournaments and then what are you doing volunteer wise for, for uh, the state of Minnesota? So the, uh, the tournaments have its a whole evolution I've, i the first catfish one i started was back in like 2007 it was just kind of a friendly thing um we call it king of the cats and it just has evolved and it's it's gotten to the point where there's probably like 100 people that do it now and it, it runs throughout the season and one of the things that has really made it easy is this fish donkey app that uh as it turns out a guy i went to school with developed the app and uh, I've been using that, and it has really made administering these contests uh, a lot easier. Basically, you, you know, you take a picture of the fish, show the measurement, take a picture holding it, enter it, and uh, it's your five biggest fish of the season. And uh, what I didn't expect is what uh, how competitive it was going to be. Like some of these contests end up being, you know, down to the quarter inch at the end of the year of everyone's, you know, to win this thing, you got to catch, you know, like five 50 pound flatheads in order to win it. So, um, in the channel cats, you probably got to catch like five 20 to 30 pounders. So it's uh, really competitive, but it's fun to see all these big fish. And the best part is they're, they're documented, you know, on this app and you can go back and look at these fish anytime you want. And there's no questioning how big they are. Cause the, the measurements right there, everyone gets to look at everyone's measurements. So I found that, uh, really good for the contest uh, i do the same thing for sturgeon king of the sturgeon so i do a, a one in the spring one in the fall and the winter as well for the sturgeon so that's kind of the contest i run um i have uh 
each year I usually do one on the water as well. We do a live catfish uh, weigh-in contest. We usually do that out on pool two, and that's coming up here in uh, mid-June. And uh, speaking of that, maybe I'll uh, mention, I'll kind of uh, maybe break a little news here on your podcast. But uh, so we have got two lines passed uh, so now we're going to be able to fish two lines on Pool 2 of the Mississippi. Wow. Pool in the Mississippi and also the Minnesota River. So, and I was, most of these fishing laws, when they are when they go into effect, it's usually the following year. And uh, I was, I'm not going to name any names, but I, one of the guys I was talking to, he's fully engaged in, uh, in this bill and knows what's going on. He told me it was uh, going live July 1st. Of the, wow. this year. So that is um, fantastic. And I haven't really said anything about that really a lot. I posted a little bit in my group, but uh, it you looks like. You heard it here. You people. heard it here first. We've got exclusives from Detro. <laughs> you heard it here first. And I've been working on that a long time. Not just me, but other people uh, within the catfish community. Uh, Brian Clowitter, who was also used to be a yeah. guide, and uh, Steve DeMars. We, uh, we went to the legislature. We testified. You know, we worked with the DNR, and we we wanted to get it statewide, and they just would not go for that. So this was kind of the compromise, and uh, and now we're going to have it. So <laughs> that, that is fantastic. That. Yeah, thank you, thank you for all that you're doing in, in that area, just to work with the state. You know, here the DNR in Minnesota is very strict as compared to a lot of other states, and so. Um, you know, there's there. I know there's a lot of work that has has to be done, um, and I know you're you're active in that. And um, on behalf of all cat fishermen, um, you know, just sturgeon fishermen, cat fishermen, thank you for all the the work that you've done uh, there. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, the uh, you mentioned the uh, sorry uh, the volunteer thing. Uh, so what that was is I mentioned it before. They have this uh, these species groups. And uh, kind of the first one, the, the inaugural catfish group, I was part of that. And, and uh, I think it was probably seven or eight of us. Um, we sat in on this group and we met and talked about different issues that we would like to see push forward, you know, kind of a, a stakeholder type thing. And, uh, you know, we brainstormed and came up with some things that uh, could have made catfishing better. And, and one of the things was uh, on the St. Croix, you could never... Uh, you can never catch like suckers and, and drum or whatever and use them, cut them up and use them for bait. It was always kind of uh, against the rules. So that was one of the things we got changed uh, was using rough fish as you catch them on the water to cut them up. And uh, I mentioned the shad thing with the cast net and uh, kind of a little bit before that, uh, Brian Clowder worked on the uh, the bullhead law, which we were able to get changed. So, you know, the size of bullheads you could use in transportation and little by little, we're chipping away at things that we want. And, uh, this two line thing was a big one, at least for the, especially That's the huge. river, you know, like that is so um, awesome, dude, there's guys all the way up to, so it goes all the way to Grand Falls. So like some of these catfish contests, like someone commented, you know, that this is going to be just in time for their, their derby days down in Franklin. And that, that just, you know, kind of brought us fantastic. Face, you know? Yeah, that is absolutely fantastic. That is so great to hear. And thanks for uh, breaking it here on another fishing podcast. Yeah, now I uh, let's just hope that the governor hasn't signed it yet. So oh, no. He said he's going to sign it. But... <laughs> Come on, Walls. Come on, Walls. Um, okay, so... I, yeah, I, I, it's I, that's I. I should probably not go. I I, I don't want to get too political here. I I've, I'm I'm trying to stay out of the political realm here on uh, another fishing podcast. I've gotten political before. I'm trying to like I get so wound up in politics that it's like okay, I need this as my um, release where I'm not talking about you know it's it's uh, anyway. But um, I really <laughs> and I know that's like that's a lot of work. So I really appreciate you doing that and 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 working with those uh, you know fellow fishermen to to get that done. That's a huge uh, huge the, deal. The huge politics deal. is so frustrating. Like especially how they get they get these laws passed. You know they they basically take everything and bundle them together. So whatever you're supporting, there's always a portion you're not supporting, and it's just it's it hurts my head to think about some of the things that passed in order to get this. Like uh, I don't know. I it's just. Uh, people tell me that was a bad thing. Well, yeah, maybe it was a bad thing, like overall, but that's the only way we're going to get this thing passed is 
getting it bundled with some bad things and I just, you know, I got to take the lumps. You know, there's some things where, you know, they're, they're not, you're not going to be able to have a wolf season. They threw that in there. Um, they added crossbows. You're going to be able to use crossbows now for deer hunting, even during the archery season. Um, there's uh, just a whole myriad of things that were That's bundled. Cra- isn't that crazy how they how they do that? They bundle stuff up? Like, you know, they do that federally, too, and then they got bills that are just gigantic that no one reads. But that's a that's a discussion. Oh, Darren, let me tell you, that's a discussion for another time. I could go off on that stuff, uh, and my blood pressure will start to rise, and that's not good. I have high cholesterol, right. yada, yada, yada. But... Um, I appreciate your time. Um, I don't want to take much more of your time. And and my wife, uh, we are going on an evening pontoon ride. So um, I've I've got to get ready. I got to get ready for that. So I'm very excited. But I want to, before we go, though, and thanks again for doing this, man. I've I've loved this conversation. Um, And you've always been so much fun to talk to. So your your information, you're very articulate. You got a ton of uh, a wealth of knowledge about catfish and sturgeon, and I just like uh, you know downloading all the information from your brain essentially. But tell people how uh, they can find you, um, and you know how they can find you, your socials, but then also just promote the hell out of your guide business, man, because you got a great thing going there. Yeah, so I mean the, the easiest way to find me is on my website. So the the site is Three Rivers Fishing Adventures. That's with the number three. And uh, there's just a list of items there shows my services or whatever. Um, I'm really active on my Facebook. I have a Facebook page as well, Three Rivers Fishing Adventures. I'm posting videos and pictures there all the time. New information. I'll probably be posting something about this uh, two-line thing. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, Three Rivers Fishing Adventures. You see the uh, pattern here. Um, so, yeah, you go there. I've had that, actually, if my YouTube channel. I've had that since 2007, I think. So, yeah, I'm kind of getting to be an old-timer there on my YouTube channel. But uh, I learned and... how to fillet catfish from that YouTube channel, <laughs> just so everybody knows. If you want to learn how to fillet, he's got a great filleting catfish video on there. That's got. I think he got like a billion views on it now. Yeah, that somehow YouTube got a hold of that one, and that one's over a million. And speaking of that, I just got into this Facebook Reels thing. Like, they sent me this thing, like, you can collect, you know, whatever, ad revenue or whatever. So I signed up for that, and I, I just, I've just, just been putting up these random things that I find sort of interesting. And the other day, I put one up of uh, uh, my friend John's got this really nice West Coast, you know, jet boat. And we were coming through Shakopee, and there was a snag, and the, the current was just blasting through there. And I was like, this is kind of interesting as he's putting it up on the trailer. So I just, all the video is, is his boat turning, going onto the trailer, going up onto the trailer. And it's like a 20 second video. For whatever reason, that one got over a million views. Like, it's just like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. They, they get a hold of these things and share it and it gets on the roll and people see it. And uh, I don't know, like I said, you just, you just got to keep throwing things up there, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, that little little tip right here. Uh, Instagram and YouTube are competing big time with TikTok. So they're competing with them by, uh, with their Instagram. It's called Reels. So it's a vertical video. You know, you're shooting it like this with your phone, and it's only a minute or less. Uh, same thing. They call them Shorts on YouTube, but both of those companies are they're really. Uh, fighting with Instagram, so they're promoting reels big time. So do reels a lot. You, what is my cat is going crazy? I might have a cat in heat right now. Maybe that was my cat. Uh, yeah, yeah no, we got it's quite a quite a zoo here. But yeah, it's it's um, it, it real. I can't tell you enough. It's kind of like been a shot in the arm for angling uploaded our YouTube channel. So um, it's uh, it's yeah, it's yeah, it's that's great advice uh do those reels and it's just basically you want to do a reel that's just it's dynamic it's interesting um people have short attention spans you just want to get their attention quickly and that's a great way to do it so um is there anything else you'd like to promote darren or anything else you'd like to say and i'm just tickled that we had this conversation nothing i can think of other than uh, i appreciate the invite and i i'm not really a big podcast guy there's a few guys that i uh I kind of watch and I appreciate the effort they put into it. And uh, you're one of them. So I was glad to be here. Oh, man. Thank you, dude. Yeah, no, you're uh, you're fantastic. I've gleaned a ton of information from you. Um, And so I say this every time, um, but I really, really we need to go fishing. 
Um, I need to get with the, the problem is, is that I, I'm, I'm gone for like six days filming Major League Fishing events and I get back and I kind of just decompress and I kind of, I'll, I'll curl up in the fetal position for a while. Um, and so I, I can kind of be like a, a recluse, you know, but um, I really need to break that. It's, it's just can be kind of a crazy schedule, but I really, really would love to fish with you. Um, maybe we can do a video or something, but uh, would love to collaborate with you on, on, you know, YouTube or whatever, but would just in general, just love to fish with you sometime. Absolutely. Maybe we could uh, get up and do that channel cat thing. I think that would make a fun video again. Like, yeah, uh, and yeah, and you know, you don't. I got my boat. I'm closer. Um, so you know, we we should definitely try to make that happen. Sounds so, good. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to you on that, and um, because yeah, that's probably something I'm gonna be doing quite often and, and doing videos on because I think it's just so much fun, and I think people would would enjoy it. So. Um, Thank you, brother. Uh, again, um, check uh, Darren out. Check out Three Rivers Fishing uh, dot com. Right, Three Rivers Fishing dot com. Three Rivers Fishing Adventures Adventures dot com. Three Rivers yep. Fishing Adventures dot com. And um, this guy's the man, Darren. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And like I said, I've learned a ton from this guy. Uh, check out the May issue of In Fisherman. That's him right there. Right there. Um, the man with a big flathead. So a lot, you'll, you know, you can get more in depth too with how he's catching these uh, giant sumo flatheads. So thanks again, Darren. Really enjoyed it, brother. Thank you, Greg. Have a good night on that pontoon. Get some Thank bug spray. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The mosquitoes are out. <laughs>